Hello again. Welcome to this closer look at the text um, for our Bible study, Sisters in Scripture. We are on our second session of the New Testament, and our subject is Mary of Nazareth. I hope you've enjoyed the conversations that you've had with the others and your own reflection upon this remarkable woman, Mary of Nazareth, the mother of Jesus. Perhaps you've had a chance to think upon and share with one another what it is about her that you most are attracted to or identify with. Is it that she is so impressively, amazingly holy, very godlike? Or is it that she is actually very human, like ourselves? She is, of course, both holy and human, as are we. Maybe you've had a chance to tell some stories to each other about times when uh, Mary's life and your life's circumstances have intersected and you've been enriched by those kind thoughts of uh, how we can learn from her. Uh, if you have not, that's okay too. Maybe that's not been a huge part of your spirituality and that's okay, but this maybe is an invitation uh, something new to consider in your life. By now, I think we've laid a groundwork and we uh, uh, shared enough of one another that we are appreciative of the various ways in which each of us grow as individuals in our walk with Jesus. So, uh, for our teaching portion, what I'd like us to do is uh, take a look at the uh, particular portion in Luke 1, those verses 46 through 55, Mary's uh, response, which is a um, poem, a song, or in Hebrew, a canticle. It's called the Magnificat. It comes by that title from the opening word when it is in Latin. It's um, for the, my soul doth magnify, it begins with the verb. And it's Magnificat, so it's often referred to as the Magnificat. The fact that it is uh, in this form of Jewish literature that is a canticle speaks a good deal to us about the way that Mary is portrayed here. She shows a familiarity with the story of her own people, the, um, also with the prayers in the Psalms and the Songs of Judaism. This canticle that she sings is reminiscent of Hannah's in 1 Samuel chapter 2. There's also the, the canticle of Deborah. And then in a few verses, we'll get to the canticle of Zechariah as well. Canticles begin with a few stanzas that are uh, that praise God. And it always ends attesting to God's mercy and faithfulness. In the middle of Mary's canticle, the Magnificat, um, it takes on a universal tone. Here, uh, Mary not only looks back to Israel's uh, deliverance and God's mercy toward Israel, but it looks forward to deliverance as well. The um, verbs if we were able to read Greek, we would see that all of the verbs in the Magnificat are in a rather unique tense, something called the aortic tense. We have nothing like this in English. The aortic tense is uh, refers to the future, but it comes about in the present. So it's kind of got this stretchy sense of time. And so what Mary is saying in all of these is she's looking to a future, a time in the future where all of this will come about, but recognizing that it starts in the here and the now. That's what the aortic tense that Luke is writing in here is. Um, so there's an awareness here on Mary's part that all of these reverses that God is bringing about will happen in the future, but they have begun right here, right now. This is in the present moment with this child within her that this starts to happen. So um, remarkable 
theological statement as well. There's, she really stands in the role of a prophet here, speaking to the future. And these, um, this reversal that is proclaimed is on many levels. There's the, the social level, where those who fear God will know mercy, but the arrogant will be dispersed. There's the economic level, where the, the hungry will be filled with good things, where the rich will be sent away empty. And there's also the political level, wherein the lowly will be raised up and the mighty will be cast down from their thrones. It's, um, it, it, it reminds you a little of the language that later Jesus uses in the Beatitudes. And Mary stands here proclaiming that at the very start of uh, the lifetime of Jesus on earth. So much like her cousin, Elizabeth, she too is a prophet. These words of Mary um, speak to uh, all of those. Mary stands in the shoes of all of those who are these marginalized. Uh, she speaks not just of their neediness or her lowliness. The emphasis, no, is on God's mindfulness and abundance and care. These words have given hope to millions of people down through the centuries. Now, the Magnificat is part of the daily prayer life of the church. It is said, or actually sung, usually, every morning as part of morning prayer. So this would happen in many traditions of, the, of Christendom, at churches and abbeys and monasteries, but also in communities and by individuals and in homes. All those who enter into the pattern of prayer that is the liturgy of the hours. This pattern of, of prayer or liturgy of the hours is something I want to spend a little time on as well, because this first chapter of Luke that we're studying right now is well represented in the liturgy of the hours. For there's another point in the day, and that would be midday at the Angelus when um, the emphasis is on verses 26 to 37, where uh, angel, the angel, Angelus, <laughs> again, the Latin, where the angel Gabriel comes and speaks to Mary. Some of you, I suspect most of you, are probably familiar with this work of art. Now, this is just a printed out off the computer sort of thing. This is Millet's Angelus. Do you remember ever seeing this? And it shows this couple out in the fields, this is in the Middle Ages, this man and woman who stop in the middle of their work. They leave it all behind to bow their heads, to pray, to recollect. You see in the background there, the spires of the church. It's very likely a monastery. And what would happen as, as the monks and the nuns in the monastery prayed the Psalms throughout the day in the liturgy of the hours, the people surrounding that in the villages and in the fields would do the equivalent. Um, as an illiterate people, they didn't know the Psalms, they couldn't read them, but there were forms of that that they could memorize. And in this case, it would be the um, words of both Gabriel and Elizabeth to Mary uh, in those verses of Luke. So, um, you know, it's interesting that in the Middle Ages, people felt called to stop and in their busyness to recollect and pray. Because I think we're probably a heck of a lot busier, more in need of that today. We know that this particular prayer from the Angelus was developed by the Franciscans and was in place by at least 12 or four, if not earlier. So um, the bells would ring as these prayers are said, and to remind people. And bells essentially are a call to prayer. They make us stop whatever we're doing. They could be, you know, a lot of places we still get that noon time that might be a siren or a bell or the fire station, something that just really don't mean it's noon. But it goes back to this, and it's a, a reminder to us. It's fascinating to me that the Franciscans chose 
as the subject of this meditation, this reflection time. That incarnation moment wherein Mary becomes aware and says yes to God's invitation in her life. So the Angelus is always that, that time for us to stop what we are doing for just a moment and say yes to God, to um, say invite God into our lives and express our willingness to be Christ bearers to others uh, in our world and in our, our daily life. In a way, it takes us right back to where we started, where we wondered, you know, what is it that's most appealing to us about Mary? Um, is it the eternal or is it the everyday? Here we have in the Angelus book, it's a reminder of where the eternal enters into our everyday. Uh, I would recommend to you the practice of trying to pause from time to time. I have a friend who, um, I just started this myself, we'll see how it works, who takes her cell phone and um, I've done the same thing, set it so at noon there's just a tiny little bell that sounds to remind me that it is that hour, once again, to remind ourselves, even if it's a simple yes, the words of the um, Hail Mary, whatever, where once again, God enters into our lives. So, something for you to consider between now and the next time. Next time, we will be discussing a lady who is at least has a reputation for being perhaps a bit too busy. And we'll get to Martha Beckham. Uh, enjoy reading about her. I know we're going to have a good time talking about her. Until then, um, God bless. Thank you for joining.